The view of work for most people is that it is a utilitarian function. In other words, my job is just this thing I do. When you are doing what you were created to do, then you sense great purpose in your life because you go, wait a second, this isn't about a J-O-B. everyone and welcome to the Christy Wright Show. I'm so excited because today we are talking about a topic that you ask me about all the time, life balance. How do you balance it all? We're gonna talk about it and we're gonna talk about why you might be feeling out of balance in the first place. And then I get to sit down with my good friend and fellow Ramsey personality, Ken Coleman. He is an expert in pursuing your passion, chasing your dream, and doing work that matters. And we're gonna talk about how our work really affects our sense of balance. But first, let's talk about this whole idea of life balance. Now, I'll tell you, I have been a professional speaker for over a decade. And regardless of the event I'm speaking at, whether it is a women's event, a church event, a men's event, it does not matter. I'm always asked this million dollar question, how do you do it? How do you balance it all? Whether it's about your family or a business or a busy career or just a busy life, we all wanna know. What's the secret? What's the secret to managing your time? What's the secret to being more efficient? What's the secret to getting more done, being more productive? How do we get more time? What's the secret? And what's interesting is as I'm asked this question again and again in lots of different groups, I notice that there's a pattern. We all seem to want life balance, but we have no idea what that means. Do you? Like, think about it. Have you ever stopped to define what life balance means to you? What is that? Does it mean that we spend 50% of our time at work and 50% of our time at home? No. That's not realistic and it's not even desirable in most cases. Life balance is not this 50-50 split. Well, okay, does it mean that I perfectly divide my day among all my different activities? I'm gonna have an hour for this and an hour for this and an hour for this? No, I mean, that's not realistic either. And again, it's not even desirable. And it certainly would never reflect the reality of the demands on you or the season of life that you might find yourself in. So here's what I've noticed. We all know that we want life balance and we have no idea what it is. Well, how are you ever gonna achieve something if you don't define it? It's like this moving target, right? It's always haunting you that you're out of balance and you know you want it, but you don't know what it is. All you know for sure is that you don't have it, right? It's this elusive thing that we can't pin down. We're just sure we don't have it. We're sure that we're not balanced. We're not doing it right. We're not managing our time well enough. We don't know what it is. We just know we want it and we know we don't have it. Well, I wanna give you a definition of life balance today that can help you on your own journey to feel a sense of balance in your life, however busy or crazy it might be. This is what I believe. Life balance is not doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. It's about spending your one life on what's actually important to you. And spoiler alert, what's important to you can change. And it will in any given season. But when you understand that life balance is spending your time on what's important to you at any given time, then here's what's really cool. You can be crazy busy. You can be in a difficult season, but you feel that sense of balance. So if this is life balance defined, if this is spending our life on what's important to us, then what gets in the way of that? Like what are the barriers to feeling balanced? What are the things that make us feel out of balance. Well, I've done research on this for years, and I have certainly experienced this in my own life as a busy mom that has a lot of interest and passion, a full-time job where I travel, and three kids under age six. So I live this out every day in a very real way. Here are what I believe are the four causes of us feeling out of balance. And as I walk through these, I want you to think about 
for you which one you might struggle with the most. The first source of why we feel out of balance is doing too many things. This is the most obvious, right? Our culture is more connected, overworked than ever before. Technology is moving faster than ever. We've got a device in our pocket that shouts our name 24 hours a day with notifications and rings and dings, vibrating, lighting up, people calling our name. And then you have the workforce that expects you to be on 24 seven because you can be, because your email is in your pocket. And so you've got all these external factors that contribute to you doing too many things. But then let's be honest, you bring some of your own issues to the table. I do too, I'm with you. We are people pleasers. We don't wanna say no. We feel guilty for saying no or hurting someone's feelings. We have a need to be loved and we want people to like us. We wanna be the hero. We wanna save the day. We wanna prove ourselves. I'm a good mom. Look at all the things I volunteer for. We wanna do it all. We wanna impress people. Look at how much I love my child. My party's so perfect and they're one years old and won't remember it, right? Like we have all these things that we bring to the table that contribute to this out of balance from doing too many things. We're just exhausted. We don't have any margin and we're tired. As long as you run faster than you possibly can and have a life that is not even remotely enjoyable because of how much you have crammed and crowbarred into your schedule, you will never feel balanced. It's too much. I remember the spring of 2016 when I was in one of those seasons where I had said yes to everything. I had said yes to too many things, and I was becoming so anxious and overwhelmed at the schedule I had allowed and created. And I sat down one day when I started to feel like I was going to break, and I was like, I just need to write it all down. What all do I need to do, and how long will it take? And I sat down and I wrote out everything I needed to do and every minute that it would take. And I wanna say that the total amount of hours for the month of what I needed to do for work was around 440 hours. And then I looked at my calendar to see how much time I had to work. And I had 423 hours. If I never took a break, if I never stopped to go to the bathroom, if I never ate lunch, if I never sat down, if I never even paused to think, I still wouldn't get it all done. When you do too many things, you will feel out of balance. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're that type A go-getter. You have a lot of interest and you just want to do it all, so you're gonna try. But the reality is you can't do it all and you feel out of balance because you're doing too many things. Now, the second source of why you might feel out of balance is actually the opposite. It's not doing enough things. Now, this is maybe more rare, but let's give an example that everyone's going to understand. Last year, during the pandemic, during the quarantine, when your calendar was cleared and you went home, at first you loved it. At first you loved the break, you loved the sleeping in, staying in pajamas, going for walks with your family around the neighborhood in the beautiful spring weather. At first it was novel, it was exciting, it was a, oh, a break from your busy life. But then, three weeks into it, six weeks into it, you were bored, right? You needed some structure to your days. You didn't know what day it was. Every day was Groundhog Day. Where do I go? I don't have any reason to put on makeup. I don't have any reason to put on pants. You started to lose any sense of where you are in your world and your schedule and your structure and the things that give you joy and energy. And the reality is if you don't have an outlet to feel productive, an outlet to use your gifts in a way that bring you joy, you're going to feel out of balance. Maybe you're in a season of life where you have spent your whole life focusing on your kids and obsessing about them and doing everything for them and and your days were filled with them and now the last one's gone off to college, you're an empty nester for the first time and you're going, what do I do? What do I do with my time? And you feel out of balance because you're not sure what to do with your time and your calendar is clear. You're not doing enough things and you need to figure out how to get back that sense of balance to do the right things in this new season for you. So the first source of why you're out of balance is you're doing too many things. The second source is you're not doing enough things. The third source of why you feel out of balance is you're doing the wrong things. Here's the reality. You can perfectly manage your schedule and your calendar and your time 
But if you spend your time and your schedule on the wrong things, things that are not important to you, you will never feel balanced. Let's use a very practical example. Let's say that you work hard to manage your calendar, you have a very good system at home, but you work in a job that you hate. If you spend 40 plus hours of your week in a job that you hate, you will never feel balanced. Never. You can't spend a large portion of your time and your life on something you hate and feel balanced. So one of the sources of why we feel out of balance is we're doing the wrong things. Things that are not important to you, things you don't like, things that don't bring you joy, things that aren't a priority. So whether you are spending your time in a job you hate or maybe just running yourself ragged trying to please all these people doing what they want you to do that you don't actually care about, every time you do the wrong things and spend your life on the wrong things, you will feel out of balance. And that brings us to the fourth source of why you feel out of balance. You're not doing the right things. Now that may sound the exact same as what is just said, but it's not. You can be doing the wrong things, like a job that you hate, and you feel out of balance. But what if you're just kind of going through the motions? Your job's not terrible, but you don't love it. And you have all these interests and things that bring you joy that are not in your life at all. You never have time for yourself. You never have time for that hobby you love. You never have time to read. You never have time to rest. You never have time with God. You never have time to work out. You never have time with friends. You never have time for those things that are the right things. You're just going through the business of life. You're running errands. You're shuttling your kids around to sports. You're picking up the dry cleaning. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It needs to get done. But it's also not particularly life-giving. It doesn't give you energy and joy. It doesn't make you light up and come alive. It's not those things that are super important priorities to you. You can have a normal, vanilla, mundane, going through the motions life not doing the wrong things, but if you're not doing the right things, you're going to feel out of balance. You're gonna feel this tug and this tension. Oh, I used to love to do that thing. Going to church is so important to me, and I haven't been in a few years. Man, I I forgot how fun it is to laugh with girlfriends at lunch, and I haven't made time for my girlfriends in months. Whenever you live your life and you don't spend it, on the right things, the things that are right to you, the things that are important to you, the things that are priority to you, you will always feel out of balance. So whether you're too busy doing too many things or you're not doing enough things or you're doing the wrong things or you're not doing the right things, you will always feel out of balance. So what about you? Which one of those do you struggle with? The first step is simply understanding why you feel out of balance in the first place, and then you can take practical steps to fix it. Because life balance is not doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. So what's right? What's right for you right now? What's important to you right now, in this season, this month, this week? What is most important to you? And no, everything's not important. If everything's important, nothing is important. What is important to you right now, where you are in your season, in your situation, in your life? When you know what those things are, you can work actively to spend your time on them. And when you do, you will feel that sense of balance you've been looking for. Hey everyone, Easter is such a special time and I love sharing the Easter story with my kids. But as you can imagine, sometimes that conversation can get a little tricky. That's why I love Minnow. Minnow has shows that kids love with values that parents trust. And with a ton of episodes specifically on Easter, they help me answer all of my kids' questions about God. Celebrate Easter in a new way with your family this year with Minnow. You can go to gominnow.com or download the Minnow app. And if you use the code Christy, you'll get your first month free. All right, y'all, I'm so excited because today I get to sit down with one of my very good friends, fellow Ramsey personality, author, of the Proximity Principle, Ken Coleman. Ken, thanks. This Christy, this here. is fun. I get to be in your living room. It's very it's, exciting. It's my actual living room, yes. everyone. 
This is awesome. I love this. So we sit by each other every day, even though we're rarely both in the office. Right. But we have the same role here at Ramsey Solutions, but we really have a different focus. So I would love it if we would just start by you introducing yourself to our audience. I know they've heard from you before, but just tell them a lot about your passion to help mm. people find their calling and kind of even the backstory of, of the proximity yeah. principle. Well, you know, I'm, I am just absolutely dedicated to helping people realize that they have a unique role in this world. They were created for a role. And that means that you have to figure it out, and then you got to do it. Right. And it starts with saying, is this really true? Do I feel like that there is a unique contribution that I'm supposed to make in this world? And it's unequivocally yes. Yeah. Even if you don't believe it, and that's what I spend my time doing, is showing people how to discover that. And they look inward and say, hey, I was created to fill a unique role in my work. Now, I'm focusing on the work sure. side of this. And that means I'm needed, I'm valuable, despite what anybody has said about me or done to me, I have value. But then there's this other side of this. That's just two thirds of the equation. You must do it. Right. I don't think we have the option to go through this life, Christy, and not make the contribution that our creator created us to do. Here's why. I think people are out there that need us to show up. Yeah. When Christy Wright is the best version of her, yeah. Somebody out there bumps into that and needs that. Yeah. And I think that's whether you're a mechanic, an HVAC technician, a plumber, a welder, a professor, a teacher, a physicist, it doesn't matter. When you are doing what you were created to do, then you sense great purpose in your life because you go, wait a second, this isn't about a J-O-B. Yeah. This is about a contribution. And I think that when people discover their meaning and they see that they can put it into practice, and make a contribution, uh, I think that we have uh, a real win in this world where people go, wait a second, I matter, and I'm beginning to make the difference that I'm supposed to make. Yeah. And I think that uh, is is the, the whole goal for me, is to turn those light bulbs on for people and see that, A, they can figure it out, B, they can get there, yeah. and C, they've got to do it. Yeah. I love that you hit on this first part, too, because I think just helping people understand that it's possible yeah. is half the battle because so many people have this belief that it's it should be a job. If it's fun, it shouldn't. If it's if you love it, it's probably you're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? And I think that there's an old school mentality to that. Mm. I remember um, when I worked at the a newspaper in town right out of college, and um, it was just miserable. Like gray cinder block walls, gray cubicles, <laughs> sure. gray ceiling. I died a little inside every day. I was entering mm. data into a spreadsheet, yeah. which you know is just yes, <laughs> not for you. Skill. That is <laughs> torture, nightmare. Yeah. <clears throat> so after a couple months of this. I had this aha moment. I was 22. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't know what my calling was. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I just knew I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting across the office from my supervisor at the time when I put in my notice. And she looked at me and she said, Christy, I don't understand. A job is a job. Do you mm -hmm. just not want to work? And you know me, Ken. Like, I love to work. I love to work. Yeah. But there was something, and she'd been there 40 years. There's an old school mentality of work is work, a job is a job. You go in, you clock in, you do the work, go home. It doesn't matter if you're happy. You're not supposed to be happy. It's a job. So help us understand yeah. this, what you're trying to teach people, yeah. that they might misunderstand about a job, about work that matters, about a career, and how they can actually do something they love that they're good at and make a difference and make a career and an income out of it. So talk a little bit about just a mindset shift here, because I think that's that's the hardest part for so many people. It is, and that story about that coworker of yours really beautifully illustrates this. this there's two worldviews of work. One worldview, and it's pretty dominant. And by the way, this is from New Hampshire to Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. This is not an yeah. American thing. The view of work for most people is that it is a utilitarian function. It's a big, long word, but what that means is, is that I, I work to live. In other words, my job is just this thing I do that I have to do because right. it produces money so that I can cover the four walls, right? right? And then if there's a little bit left over in the four walls at Ramsey Solutions, obviously that's your, your housing, uh, that is your utilities, that's your food and your transportation. And then, of course, we got some clothes and we've got the kids' camps and there's all these things. We go, we've got to pay for this. So work just becomes this thing that we do. It means to an end. And here's what happens. So then we accept meaningless work. Because we go, I got to work, right. which is true, right. but there's this worldview that just says that's all it is. And so what happens is we'll put up with the average job. We'll put up with a miserable job yeah. because we just see there's no other option to make money. Now let's flip it. 
So what I'm trying to do is, is disrupt this worldview and through Ramsey Solutions, get out there and say, wait a second, what if you live to work? I'm going to let that sit for a second yeah. because I think a lot of people go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't believe in that. Your worth is way more than your work. You're right. Right. I'm not preaching that you need to be a workaholic. That's not healthy. That's right. a recipe for disaster. But let's look at this. I live to work. Let me change the word from work for a moment to contribute. I touched on this in my first answer, but I live to contribute. Now, everybody on the planet, nobody, nobody goes through life and never wonders, why am I here? What should I do with my life? Nobody gets through life without that thought racing through their mind at some point. Right. So what does that tell us? Well, you and I agree on this, that we were created to contribute. Right. So we start there and you go, wait a second, whether I believe there's a God or not, I do want to help people. Right. The most confused callers I get on The Ken Coleman Show will say, at least when I ask them, well, you say you don't know what you want to do. Come on, I think you want to do something. What do you want to do? I don't know, Ken. I just want to help people. Ding, 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 ding. Who are the people you want to help? Right. What is the problem or challenge they have? Or what is the desire they have? Yeah. Let's just look at this for a moment. I could want to help uh, people who are dealing with substance abuse. That's a, that's a challenge and a problem that that person has. And I got some connection to them. But I could also want to design shoes for women to make them feel pretty. <laughs> And you love some shoes, Ken. Let's I be love some shoes. <laughs> true I story, Ken has more shoes than I do. It's probably, that's a fact. <laughs> it's probably, it's probably true. And that's okay, dudes. You can embrace that. Uh, but you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't always have to be this big world It doesn't have to be a ministry problem. job. It doesn't have no. to be in hey, the church. Your you work doesn't matter. Hair. Hair. Yeah, Why yeah. do you want to do hair? Every hairstylist that I've talked to who loves their work, it's not about the hair. Yeah. It's the creativity in the moment where right. they come in and the, and the woman says, I want to do this differently or I right. want this. How and the so person a, feels when they walk out, like getting to create that transformation. It. It's not just the creativity, but it's also, I'm kind of like their bartender. I'm kind of like their counselor. <laughs> I think the world's greatest counselors are in are in uh, beauty salons. Hey, you're sitting there for three hours. Salons. You got a lot of yeah. time to talk. <laughs> so, so what I try to do is I help people understand, wait a second, let's just go back to, forget what Ken says, what Christy says, forget what you believe about God. You just wrestle with this on your own. Yeah. Have you ever wondered, what should I do with my life? Yeah. And do you at your core long to help people? And the answer is yes. So living on purpose and working on purpose are inextricably yeah. combined. You, you can't pull them out. And so it's not about workaholism and success and flying on a private jet. I hate that stuff. It's motivational gibberish. It's a lie. Here's the issue. You could be a teacher and be an everyday millionaire. Chris Hogan proved it. That's right. The, the average salary, Christy, in America for a teacher right now, this is the average across the board is $60,000. How is it that teachers, not every teacher, because I get a lot of those calls, but how is it that a teacher can be so fulfilled? Well, they are using their talent, what they do best, to perform their passion, to instruct, to guide, yeah. to produce results that matter deeply to them, their mission, which is to give a kid a lift, to train a kid, sometimes just to love on a kid. Yeah. So all said... When we start to see work as, wow, this is about my contribution. This is about meaning. And I can make plenty of money yeah. when I am living and working in a job, a career that is terrifically meaningful to me. Yeah. See, when we get all that, we go, oh. And then I find that you make enough money. It's not yeah. about money. Yeah, yeah. So that's the deep-rooted thing that I'm trying to help people see. And when they begin to see that, they go, oh. Okay, so let's so so we've talked about the external result of doing work that matters, yeah. being in your gifts, and so on. So you've got the the impact, yeah. the the woman that walks out of the hair salon. You've yeah. got the uh, the money that you make that yep. provides the means to an end, like we talked about. So your your camps, your food, your shelter, so on. Talk a little bit about what it does for you personally mm -hmm. when you are doing that work that matters, because you know what we were talking about earlier today, and you've heard me talk about life balance all the time. I, I, similar to you, I like to redefine this word for people and, and reframe it for people where life balance isn't doing everything for an equal amount of time. It's about doing the right things at the right time. And when you do the right things at the right time, you feel balanced. And, and so as we've been unpacking, there are some sources of why we feel out of balance. We feel out of balance when we're doing too many things. We feel out of balance when we're doing, we're not doing enough things. Uh, we feel out of balance when we're doing the wrong things. And we feel out of balance when we're not doing the right things. And I think what's so interesting is you could have someone that manages their time well, that um, you know has a lot of great things going on in their life, but they're in a job that they hate. And if you're in a job that you hate, 40 plus hours a week, 
you're never going to feel mm -hmm. any sense of balance because you're doing the wrong things. It's going to make you feel out of balance when you spend your life on the wrong things. So talk about, yeah. for someone that has never experienced a job they love, they might even have trouble believing that's possible. Mm -hmm. They're like, Ken, ex explain to me what it would feel like to not dread Mondays, to go to work and have fun. Yeah. Like, talk about the result, the, the personal yeah, sure. results we feel. Yeah, I'm not going to explain that. it. I'm going to prove it. And what's great is it's not even my opinion. So there's a guy by the name of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. You'd never be able to spell it in a million years. <laughs> okay. uh, but he's a, a psychologist, and for over 30 years, he has been teaching the theory of flow. He's got a TED Talk on it. Okay. So if you want a deep dive on this, just go to YouTube or TED Talks and, and, and look up flow. And so he describes flow as this feeling of euphoria. Okay. 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 But what he's saying is you feel this euphoric feeling when you're doing something that you're really, really good at. Yeah. He would say proficient. Yeah. I just say you're good at it. Yeah. It's talent. Yeah. And that you actually love the work because the ta you enjoy the task itself. Like you and I, we get excited about developing a talk or writing a book. So there's nobody paying attention in those moments. Right, but it's we, just fun. We love developing the talk and writing a book as much as we love selling the book or right. giving the talk. Right. That's what I call high emotion, high devotion. And oh, I learned I like that, that, from, I like his, that. Okay. from his theory, which I like means that. this. I get excited when I think about the work. Yeah. When I'm in the middle of the work, I feel that ecstasy is what he says. Yeah. It's not a, I mean, people have perverted that word. Yeah. This is just an emotion. Right, right. Which emotions are given to us by our creator. Yeah. You and I both believe that. Yeah, yeah. So when I am doing something that I'm good at, yeah. and I love the work, I'm already in a great emotional state. So the question was, how do we feel? What does it feel like? Yeah. Well, you feel like you're in this state of flow, or again, you could say, I say it's like being in the sweet spot of life. Yes. And the sweet spot is the analogy I use because any of us who've ever played a sport, whether you've hit a baseball at a batting cage or yeah. gone to the golf club or you know, and hit a ball, the, the reason they call it the sweet spot is the designer of the club yeah. said this is the spot on the club that if you hit the ball there, you're gonna get maximum performance, speed, distance, and oh, by the way, it'll feel good, too. Yeah. Anybody's ever hit the ball the right way? You don't even feel the contact. Yeah. <laughs> I okay, have not, what? by the way, but I hear. Right. <laughs> I hear. <laughs> but everybody understands that. Yeah. So that's what it feels yeah. like. Number one, I enjoy it. Yeah. Because, again, I'm not frustrated. Let's just, let's, all of us have had kids. Uh, think about how frustrated a kid is when you try to train them on something and they're no good at it. You know how frustrating it is for a kid trying to ride a bike the first time? Yeah. There's all kinds of emotions there. They're frustrated, they're fearful. Yeah, yeah. Well, they who among us likes to do things that we're awful at? Yeah. But here's where we're at in the Western world, Christy. We're fighting this overriding philosophy that says you gotta work on your weaknesses. So if you spend all your time working on your weaknesses, you are in frustration. Yeah. Well, if you're in a job that you're not really good at, you're not succeeding. Right. You're not receiving the one thing that humans crave more than anything, yeah. and that is, am I seen, am I noticed, recognition. Yeah. Yeah. So there's so much here. Yeah. But I mean, what you ask, what does it feel like? It feels amazing. You are looking forward to the work because you yeah. go, I'm going to be good at this. This is going to be easy for me. Yeah. But more importantly, I really love the work. Yeah. Why? Not just because you're good at it, not just because you love the task, but it also produces a result that matters. So you want to be on purpose. Here's how you're on purpose. When you use what you do best, your talent, to perform work you love, your passion, to produce results that make your heart swell, mission. Mm -hmm. You use what you do best to perform work you love, to produce results that matter. Okay, that's a really short sentence. Yeah. But that's out there in the workplace, that combination Christy. Is powerful. In multiple yeah. jobs, ready yeah. for this? Multiple career paths. Yeah. And I would even tell you there's multiple dream jobs. Yeah. You and I are both in our dream jobs right now. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. But if we had to, there are other dream jobs for Christy Wright out there. Okay, let's as long talk about as this. you are in that sweet spot. Let's talk about this because I think that's interesting. And I have so many questions. I was just thinking of more and more questions. Keep going so I want to come back. To, Speed round. Here we I want to come back to a couple of things you said. But while we're here on this, the multiple jobs, because I want I want to go with this. I think when some people hear the word calling, they interpret that as there is one thing I was put on this earth to do. You're I right. was here to be a teacher right. at this school and so on. That is intimidating to it people. It is, and it's wrong. So help help us understand yeah. that. What do you mean by the multiple jobs yeah. that stay in your sweet spot? Yeah, so uh, let's stay in this teacher example because you gave me the example, and I get this call all the time on the Ken Coleman Show, and, and this is real. Ken, I'm so confused. 
Uh, I've been a teacher for eight years. I loved it, it's all I ever wanted to do, but I am miserable and I don't feel like I'm in my sweet spot anymore, but I don't know what to do, help. Yeah. yeah. Well, what we do is we begin to examine in that phone call, Christy, why you've lost the juice for it, the passion. Why do you not love it anymore? Yeah. Well, what we find out almost every time is it's the environment. Mm. So you can be doing the right thing. Let's take teaching as a position and a title out of this answer. Okay. And now let's say what at their heart are they really doing? And let's pick a word that would describe the role of a teacher. It is instructor. Mm. So you love instructing, right? but you're in a public school environment, I'm not picking on public schools, but right. where there's a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of paperwork, mm -hmm. you're, you're unable to discipline the kids. Yeah. This is straight from about 100 calls, so I sure. know this is right. And so you're going, I love instructing, but I don't like doing it here. here. So then I say to them, where are some other places that you can be an instructor? Right. And we're pulling off the teacher title. We're pulling off elementary ed, middle school, right. whatever. And we begin to say, well, what about higher education? Yeah. For some, that shift is, Higher education. For some, it's I'm gonna get into HR and do training in HR. Yeah. I'm yeah. gonna be a corporate trainer, so be a sales trainer. Because why? What do they love, Christy? It's instruction. Yeah. So are there other people besides little kids with snotty noses that you would <laughs> love instructing? The answer is always yes. Yeah. So we walk them through that construct. Okay. Are you talented at instruction and communication and verbal skills and empathy and all the things? Yeah. And do you love Listening, guiding, instructing, preparing, communicating. Yeah. Well, okay, look, besides elementary school kids, who are some other people that you could get excited about? And so you walk that formula yeah. out and they go, oh. Yeah. So so teaching was a dream job six years ago. It's no longer. Yeah. Now the dream job may be HR training or corporate training yeah. or consulting or whatever, yeah. as long as they are doing that primary thing that they love in their sweet spot. And so that's the answer to, yes, there are multiple dream jobs. Absolutely yes. there are. Because here's the other thing, and I gotta add this. So I wrote about this in a book that's coming out this fall. Mount Everest is the analogy, climbing the mountain is what I use you know, in, yeah. in my show for people to grasp this climb to this meaningful work. Yeah. Well, when you get to the dream job, what's next? You're not done. You don't just get in a hammock with a glass of sun. Right, tea. right. What's happening? So, uh, so when when you get to the top of the mountain, now you've been going like this the whole time. But when you get up here on top and you step in the dream job, remember you've been looking this way. Now you're looking this way. Yeah. And this is how everything shifts, Christy. So I go from looking up, 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 up. Now I'm here. I see the beautiful view, and I go, oh, I'm here. This is great. And now I'm looking out, and that's what happens. The dream expands. Mm, that's good. I'm still in my dream job, yeah. but I'm not done. I'm right. going to expand the dream. So I continue, and I look for a new mountain to climb. Yeah, a new challenge. All within that sweet spot. So. That's the answer to the question. That's why there are multiple dream jobs. And by the way, that'll free your soul. It'll totally, because you, you realize you're not painted in a corner in this one thing that you're just destined to forever. Yeah, we you see this options. in relationships as well. Right. Is he the one? Is she the one? What if I marry her or marry him and there's somebody else? No, 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 no. Come on now. It's yeah. the same decision-making process. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about making the wrong decision. That's why I teach the sweet spot. As long as you're in that sweet spot, yeah. use what you do well. Yeah to do work you love, to produce results that matter. Well, there's all kinds of jobs and you're gonna feel so fulfilled. And by the way, as you grow in advance, you stay in that sweet spot. Think of it as like that bubble and yeah. you just keep on running. You've seen that ridiculous halftime show where people are inside those jobs. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're running, well, they can move forward. I feel like my kids would love one of those things. Yeah, I think that's that's the joy of working yeah. and living in your sweet spot. Which, one final thing, when you are fulfilled at work, you're gonna be a better husband, yeah. a better wife, a better father yeah. and a better mother. You cannot, you can't remove these yeah. things. Yeah. When you were talking about the idea of flow and this euphoric yeah. ecstasy, like the way that it feels when you're doing work that you love, when you're in your sweet spot, it was such a good, I had this like visual that came to mind. Uh, the way that I walk uh, people through like identifying their strengths, so you and I have talked about this before, but one of the, five E questions is, what do you enjoy? Yeah. So that's what you're talking about. But also, what gives you energy? Yeah. Because when you're in your sweet spot, the way that you describe it, it actually gives you energy. It's not that you don't get tired, but but you look at, okay, I'll speak at Business Boutique for three days straight. Nonstop, 16 to 18 hour days. I'm on a stage running around. At the end of that, I'm like, I am on top of the world. Yeah. Like, I am literally, I feel like I could run a marathon because I've gotten so much energy from doing what I was created to do. Now let's rewind to 22-year-old Christy in the gray mm. cubicle oh, entering data. Zero energy. Five minutes, and I need a nap. Yeah. I died a little inside. And so, you, so when you, right. I love these questions as you talk about this, um, the the energy, the the euphoric feeling that yeah. you have. What about the reality 
of there's all we all have parts of our job we don't like. Even if you're yeah. in a job that you love. Great question. So if someone is going, okay, was this just a bad day or a hard project, or does this mean I'm not in my sweet spot? I should do something else. Because I know some people might be thinking that. That's a great question, and there's no real formula here. But I would say if 80 percent of your day you're doing yeah, something the in your sweet spot, you're there. Yeah. Because I got to go to meetings here. Oh, you and I both have things that we, we don't want to do. We totally. despise meetings. Yeah. <laughs> I do. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I do. Uh, I, I hate meetings. I love conversations. Right, yeah. Um, what takes takes 30 minutes sometimes. I could get done in three. But, yeah. you know, that's neither here nor there. That's a separate episode. Uh, but there are things, yeah, there are times where, you know, when I got here at Ramsey Solutions, I wasn't a personality. Yeah. I was in my sweet spot. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't in my dream job. Right. Okay, so again, you, you just kind of keep looking through this. Wait a second. Am I spending the majority of my day, you pick the percentage, doing work that I'm good at? Right. Do I spend the majority of my day doing work that I really love? Yeah. Do I spend the more majority of my day creating results that make me excited? Right. Okay. I love it. That's it. I love it. There's going to be times, you know, there's a great scene in the movie The Great Debaters, it's about it's it's a wonderful movie. Forrest Whitaker stars as the father. And this kid loves debate. And he's a great student. He's a brilliant kid. Yeah. He's a good kid. Yeah. But he gets into the debate team, and they're a small uh, black college, and they're competing with the big boys. And this kid's a rock star. Yeah. And and so, of course, it's all he wants to do is debate. Yeah. Because they're winning, and they're good. Right. And they're all together, and they're this team. And so the dad starts to notice that he's spending more time even in non-practice times with everybody, and we're working on it. That's all they do is practice debate. And he's going, what about your studies? And the kid's pushing back a little bit. Yeah. He's like, Dad, I'll get it, I'll get it. And he looks at him, he's like, no, you're not going. You won't compete. You won't practice until you get your work done. And the kid gets kind of huffy and kind of storms out okay, and he looks at him and he says, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. Mm, that's good. There is going to be a part of our day where we do what we have to do. Yeah. But again, back to that formula I just gave you, don't overthink it. Yeah. Roughly 80, 20, just the majority of your day. The majority, majority of your, of your day. day. Okay, I've got another question. I want to go back. You said something. No, I, but you yeah. said something beautiful I want to call out. You said it twice. When you went back to that 22 year old job in the center block, you were like, I was dying a little bit of yeah. That's not a stark overreaction when you describe it that no. way. No. That is a soul sucking thing. No, and, and so, I was terrible at the job too because yeah. I didn't enjoy it yeah. and didn't care about the results. Right. I'm like, this is me at my desk. Whereas me on stage yeah. of business, I'm like, right. like I'm so alive. That's here's the point. The heart will let you know at yeah. any point in your day if you're dying a little bit. That's and, good. and so walk around with a notepad. Yeah. Do this. Does this lift me? Yeah. Or does this hold me back? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I love that. Okay, I want to go back to the bicycle example, and I know we've got to wrap up, but I have so many questions for you because this is so helpful to people that are in that spot right now going, am I in my sweet spot? What should I be doing next? I want to do something, you know, but I'm not sure what. So let's go back to the bicycle example. And I love what you said where we are in a culture of work on your weaknesses, work on your weaknesses, but you're going to be the best at your job. You're going to be the best at home in your life when you're in your strengths, and I totally agree I'm with you. How do you help people? And I don't even, I haven't even thought through this, Ken, so I'm really curious what you think. How do you help people between you're going to be in your strengths and work on your strengths knowing you're not going to be good when you start? When I was a speaker and I started, I sucked. Right. I was terrible. You probably were too. We all were terrible. You you were terrible when you first started riding a bike. But as I developed those Mm -hmm. strengths, they became really Mm -hmm. strong strengths, just like riding a bike and so on. So how do you understand the difference? (laughs) You use the baseball example. I'm actually terrible at hand-eye coordination. I cannot right. make contact with the bat. I know that. I'm right. not going to work on it, don't want right. to, not interested. How do you discern, is this a yeah. weakness I should avoid, or is this a yeah. strength underdeveloped? I'm a beginner. How do yeah, you know? that's a really good question. So we got to make sure that we don't that we don't confuse the bike analogy. Everybody learns to ride a bike, and you're awful, and you're wobbly, and you're just going to have to learn how to crash. That's why my dad taught me to ride a bike on grass so oh. that I didn't have as much fear. I'm going to use that tip. That's good. Yeah, I like take that. take the boys on grass yeah. and show them, if you fall, Conley, you're, you are not going to have no skin. Here, right, 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 You're going to be okay. But so we have to start things. We have to practice, and that's what you're getting at. But again, how do we know? Well, you know you don't have good eye-hand coordination. You figured that out in PE maybe right. in the third grade 100%. or whatever. Okay, so we, we listen to that. We go, wait. But we also knew that young Christy was really good at connecting with people. Mm-hmm. We know that young Christy was really good with words. Mm-hmm. So again, we got to get back to that that sweet spot analogy. And if you're having a hard time discerning, go to people who will tell you the truth in your yeah. life, who know yeah. you really well. And they'll go, you know what? You're not the most athletic kid. Probably not your thing. Yeah. Um, but you're really gifted uh, in this area, verbal skills. And then you go, okay, so we start to lean that way. Now, to your question, we're still not going to be great at speaking if we try to speak 
the first time and just do it. The, right. the worst is the first, is what right. I tell myself. The very first Ken Coleman show, I would never want anybody to hear it. I hope yeah. they buried it yeah. in the ash heap of history. <laughs> yeah. Same thing with the first talk. I wouldn't want anybody to hear that. Um, and, and in fact, it's still true to this day. When you and I develop new content, and we do, we're good at it because yeah. we're good it's, at communicating yeah. now. But it's but rough at first. the first time we put it out there, I, it's not something I'm proud of. Right. I've got to embrace this thing that uh, practice— is the key to proficiency. Yeah. So what you do is, is you go, wait a second, I gotta know what my core talents are and I can take those talents, let's take it like a lump of clay. Yeah. I've actually watched a potter do this. Okay. It's really killer. They take this lump of clay off of a table and he sits in front of the stand and he puts it on the wheel and with the water and his pressure of his hands, with the wheel spinning, the inertia, he begins to shape that lump of clay into this beautiful coffee mug or a plate and it becomes this inanimate object, catch this, to this unbelievably useful tool. Yeah. That's the journey. Yeah. But we've got to work with the right clay. Like, we got to have the clay. Right. If there's no clay, there's no instrument. So what right. we do is we say, all right, this is what I'm good at, and I can be great at this. So here's a simple analogy to answer the question. If I'm a one, if one is awful, yeah. no one wants to pay me, nobody even wants to see me do this, yeah. I'm so bad, yeah. and ten's amazing, we gotta say, I'm gonna focus on the six, seven, eights, nines, and tens, because if yeah. I work my fanny off, yeah. I can turn a six into an eight. Yeah. I can turn a seven into a nine. I can turn an eight into a 10. Yeah. That's what people pay for. Yeah. That's what we enjoy. And so then I'm no longer banging my head against the wall yeah. in my work. I'm only gonna, I'm mitigating everything from a five below. I'm telling everybody I'm not very good at this. Right. I'll ask for help if I'm doing yep, this. Yep. I won't apply for a job right. that has this in the job description. Right, right. That that's the majority of what you do. Well, and so much of what you're saying, and that's why I love how you talk about, it's not just the piece of your gifts. Like, are you a talented singer? Are you a talented organizer? Whatever the thing is, it's not just your gifts. It's also your desire and what you enjoy. Because if you don't yeah. enjoy it, you're not going to want to yeah. practice those gifts regardless. I, You know, you and I are really good friends with Rachel Cruz, who's also yes. a Ramsey personality. A couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember this, Kim, but she came to the office and she made this like declaration. She's like, Christy, I've got a plan. I am going to run every day for 100 days. <laughs> Yes, I and remember. And I said, you hate to run. <laughs> yeah. I said, but it's only 20 minutes a day for 100 days. I go, no. but you hate to run. Mm -hmm. And so it's just funny. And of course, she did not do the 100 days. And we still laugh about it to this day. But if you don't like doing something, even if she was an outstanding runner, yes. she's not going to run every day. for. And, no. and same for me, entering data into a spreadsheet. Even yeah. if I was good at it but didn't enjoy it, I'm not going to want to do it to get better. And so I think that's so key to your formula of how you walk yeah. people through this because, yes, I was an okay speaker when I started, but I enjoyed it so much, I wanted yes. to do the practice to get better, and then I that's did. That's so beautiful you share that. So let's just break that down. I have no motivation to run. Yeah, well, yeah, no, but you have no motive. Mm -hmm. Motivation, the root word is motive. What's your motive? What's your why? Right. Let's just break it down. Right. If your why is, well, I'm just going to do it, no, right, right. you will like, absolutely. I love to run. You love it. I, lo I do it just because it's fun for yes. no reason. Yes, you love to run, and that's great. And so what we've got to understand is that's what's behind all of this. Mm -hmm. It's like, do I love the work itself, and am I fired up over the result yeah. of it? Yeah. If I'm not then I'm never gonna have that real true sense of meaning in my work. And, yeah. and I think when you get that, it frees you up to say, oh, this is why it's, because here's what you said. It's not enough to be good at it. Because you can do something in your career that you're really good at and you will be successful. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of six-figure, seven-figure earners who are into you know, addiction, they've got They're still divorce. miserable. They're miserable because they're only doing something they're good at. Right. They actually don't love the work. Right, right. Listen, Wall Street's full of those yeah, folks. Yeah, It's real. Go right. look it up. Right. Now, let's look at the second part of that. I can I can get in my, my work, and I can be good at it, and I can really enjoy it. And you'll have some satisfaction. Mm -hmm. You will be. You'll, you'll have a good work life. You'll, you'll, you'll be satisfied. But when you put that third piece in there, when you use what you do best— to do work that you love that produces results that has, there's a personal connection to the right. results. you care about. That's significance. Yeah, that's good. I'm not teaching success, and I'm not teaching satisfaction. Yeah. I'm trying to point people to significance. Not to say that, that you become significant when no, you No, we know, yeah. What we're saying is you experience You feel that. Significance. Yeah. So that's what this is about. Yeah. Because then you realize, wait a second, it's not about me. Right. 
Right. And I'm making plenty of money, by the way. Right. The money follows. Right. That's the caboose. Yeah, yeah. Success and satisfaction and dollar signs, those S's, yeah. that comes with it. Yeah. But when I'm in my sweet spot and I'm pursuing missional work, that's that's when we are alive. And by the way, that's when people look at you and they go, you were born for this. Mm. They say that on their own. Yeah. They don't know what the sweet spot is. Yeah. They may not even have a belief in God at all, but they'll say that. Yeah. And, and it's because we see that. We go, ah, oh, it looks so good and so efficient and so effortless, which we know it isn't. Right. So that's where all this comes together. And by the way, it is possible, yeah. whether you're 35, 45, or 55. And remember, it's not, it's, it's not about power and fame and influence. It's about significance. I love it. It's so good, Ken. This is this is so practical, but it's also so inspirational for someone listening right now and they're going, I'm in a job that I hate or I've, I've had this like nagging feeling I should do something new, but I'm not sure what. Like this is gonna be the catalyst that's gonna send yeah. the bottle and figuring out what that is for them. Okay, you have a book that helps them though. Yeah. No. Uh, well, how to start to take those, take those steps. So we wrote principle. this book, so we kind of got ahead of ourselves. We wrote this book for people who know what they want to do, but they're not sure how to get there. Okay. Or they know what they want to do, they know how to get there, but they're scared to step out. Okay. This proximity principle teaches you the proven path to work that you love. It'll tell you how to get there. A little, little cheat, it's about people and places. I love it. And, and it, it's chock full of goodness, yeah. five people in five places yeah. in the book, that if you get around those people and get in those places, opportunity knocks on your door. Yeah. That's uh, how that works. It's so simple and practical and something you can Thank actually you. start doing. It it's is. so good. Right now. Okay, let people know where they can get yeah. your book and follow you yeah. and, and continue to yeah. listen to the show and learn everything you're doing. KenColeman.com is the website. We've got a special deal. You can get all three formats, the hard copy, ebook, and audio book for one price, one price. That's unbelievable. Or wherever books are sold. And and the Ken Coleman Show is on YouTube. We're live every day at noon Eastern time. Awesome. Uh, and then we're right on the radio. So if you want to call in, the phone number's at kencoleman.com. For two hours, Monday through Friday, you can call me and we can dive right in right there for a two-hour period from 12 to 2 Eastern Standard Time, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts as well. And then now 60-plus radio stations around the country. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. That's huge. That's we're amazing. Okay. You got to listen to the show and get your question answered. Ken, thanks so much. This is yeah. so fun. Thanks this for being here. This is fun. I so love helpful. this. I need a living room, not a you do. You do. We're going we're gonna to work that out next. Yeah. <laughs> we were drawn to Christian Healthcare Ministries because we both had young families and we wanted to have more children. And we had also just started a real estate company and needed to find healthcare coverage that would meet our needs. We were attracted to CHM because of its low monthly costs and the ability to negotiate medical costs down. Established in 1981 and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, CHM is here to meet the needs of your growing family or small business. Check us out at chministries.org. We absolutely believe in it. All right, y'all, I want to share a verse with you that's very short from Ecclesiastes, but it's a great reminder for what we're talking about. As we're digging into this idea of life balance and what it means and, and defining it and trying to understand why we feel out of balance in the first place, our work is a big piece of this. Seven out of 10 Americans don't like their jobs. And if that's you and you're in a tough season where you're just doing what you need to do to get by, I get that. And you should. You've got to do what you've got to do to get through this season. But I don't want you to stay there. I don't want you to spend the majority of your life doing something that you hate. There's more to life than that. And I believe that God cares about our work. I believe God cares about us finding satisfaction in our work. And that's what brings me to Ecclesiastes 3.22. So I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work. It talks earlier in Ecclesiastes 3 about enjoying the fruits of our labor, of enjoying the work that we do, finding satisfaction in the way that we work. And for you and I, this might be a new concept because maybe, like Ken and I talked about, maybe you've never enjoyed your job. So it's hard for you to imagine having a job that you love, where you don't dread Mondays, when you've never seen it, you've never experienced it. How do you have hope for something you don't really know is out there? But I think it is something worth pursuing. Your life is too important. Your gifts are too important. Your time is too important to waste it away on something you hate, on something you dread, on something that brings you no joy, no satisfaction, no purpose, and on top of all of that, that makes you feel out of balance. So I wanna give you some journal questions to think about. 
I want you to think about what this looks like for your life as we're talking about the sources of why you feel out of balance and what makes you feel balanced so that you can take steps to create your own version of balance. Your first question is simply this. What makes you feel out of balance? When do you feel like something's not right? When do you feel like there is a gap between what you care about and what's important to you and over here how you actually spend your time? Where you feel that tension and that pull and that frustration of, oh, I love these things. These things are the right things. These are the priorities. These are important to me. But I spend all my time over here doing this stuff. What makes you feel out of balance right now or anytime? Write down your answer. All right, your second question is this. What makes you light up and come alive? What brings you joy? What makes you feel balanced? It doesn't mean your life is perfect. It doesn't mean your life is easy. It doesn't mean that everything is effortless and your time is perfectly split and you never have problems and everything is rainbows and unicorns. That's not life. If that's what you think balance is, you're never gonna get it. But if you back out of it and say, this is what balance means to me. This is what makes me feel balanced. I'll tell you one huge thing that makes me feel balanced is simply being present. When I allow myself and discipline myself to be present in the moment that I'm in, wherever that may be, whether I'm here at work, whether I'm in a meeting, whether I'm at home with my kids, whether I'm working out, whether I'm on a walk listening to a podcast or having a quiet time with God, wherever I am, if I can allow myself to be present there, I feel balanced, I feel good. I don't feel guilty. I don't have wandering thoughts. I don't feel distracted. I don't feel anxious. Simply training myself to be present in the moment that I'm in makes me feel balanced. That's one example. What about you? Maybe spending your weekends with your family. That makes you feel balanced. And when you can't, you feel very out of balance. Maybe for you, it is getting a certain amount of hours of sleep, of sleep at night. That makes you feel more balanced. You're more rested, you're happier, you're in a better mood, you're more productive, you enjoy your day more because you got the sleep you needed. And you know what that amount is. And when you get it, you feel balanced. What makes you feel balanced? Write down your answer. And your last question, how can you incorporate more of that into your life so you can actually begin to feel more balanced? What are you gonna do to work those things that make you feel balanced into your life today and this week? Write down your answer. All right, I'd love to pray for us as we wrap up. God, thank you that when we ask for wisdom, you give it to us. Thank you that when we look to you to know what we need to do, where we need to focus, where we need to spend our time, what should be important to us, what those right things are, you will answer us, you will lead us, and you will guide us. And most of all, you will give us the peace and the sense of balance that we've been seeking all along. Lord, thank you that you love us. God, I pray for every single person listening and watching right now that you would help them know what those things are so that they can strategically and intentionally spend their time on them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys so much for joining me as always. And you can tune in next week for another new episode of The Christy Wright Show. For more encouragement on building confidence in yourself and the God that created you, you can visit christywright.com.